this is Mari Robeson of Love Lulu Creative, a podcast that supports and celebrates artists and creative entrepreneurs while giving back to the community in a unique and meaningful way. This is episode number 20, and I am so excited because we are just on the heels of handing out the very first Louise Montforti Memorial Art Scholarships. We handed out three earlier this month to some lovely recipients. And if you want to know who they are, know a little bit more about them, you can head on over to my blog, marirobesonhome.com. And I did a little post there. And also I included the the video that I created for the presentation over there too. So you can see a little bit more about who the first recipients are. And they're so talented. I can't wait to watch their wonderful careers unfold in front of them. But today we are in for something really, really fun because I have my really good friend Lonnie Kohler here in my studio. And she owns Simply Clear Marketing, which is a powerhouse marketing firm here on the Central Coast. And she is a brilliant entrepreneur who has a ton of advice for all of us creatives and actually anybody in business. Anything that we talk about today can actually be applied across the board into any kind of a business that you're in. Really, really helpful. But I did want to specifically ask her about her tips for artists and she does she generously shares some really great ideas on the show and she also created a tip sheet that you can receive over at simply clear marketing just head on over to their contact page and you can get a free pdf download of all of those tips that we talk about today so you don't need to have a pen or paper in front of you. Uh, She's got it all written out for you nice and neatly there. And also while you're there, check out her services because it's really amazing what she does. She owns a magazine. She puts on home shows. She had a newspaper company for many, many years. And now she does a really wonderful service with online marketing, creating websites and digital marketing. Super interesting person to talk to. You guys are really going to get a ton of helpful advice on this episode. And I just appreciate everything that you've been doing to help me grow this podcast and subscribing and share it, please, with your friends who are, are in creative fields. I think it's it's just such good information from each one of these artists. I mean, I know I'm learning a lot and I'm really inspired. So I hope that you'll continue to help me with this mission. And that said, let's just get on with the show. Hey, Lonnie. I'm so happy to have you in my studio. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here, too. It's so fun. And we're going to try to not make this four-hour conversation. I know. <laughs> we're not very good at that, but we can do this. It's like meeting for coffee. I and it's like, wait, it's like way past lunchtime now. I know. Okay. So I want to, um, you're like my marketing guru, genius person go-to. So I am going to pick your brain and I'm excited to talk to you. So first I want to know a little bit about where you're from. Yeah. Your background. So um, I actually grew up here in San Luis Obispo. So I feel pretty lucky to live on the Central Coast. Of course, around college, I wanted out of this little tiny (laughs) town where everybody knew your name. So I went away to school in Denver. And when I came and while I was there, I realized that it's actually pretty nice to know people people in the community. And so I moved back to the area. And so I'm really a big proponent of, especially in the space, if you grow up here, you uh, tend not to see um, how lucky we are to live here. And so the Central Coast in California is pretty amazing for any of you that haven't mm-hmm. visited. Um, so I really like it and I'm grateful for living here. And so I would suggest anybody that does that lives here should move away for a little bit and then come back because then you appreciate it. Yeah. Like all my kids. Yes. They're like, bye. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which is a good staying. thing. We're not staying in this town. <laughs> and my oldest is down in LA and she just wants to move back. And oh, she wanted out so bad when she lived here. I yeah. don't ever want to live here. I want to live in a city. And so she's been down there for a couple of years now. And Well, San Luis is kind of turning into a little bit of a city. It's, I mean, yes. It's just getting those, city-fied exactly, that's, from when I went to college. There, right. <laughs> there was like 10 people. Yeah, <laughs> so, which is kind of funny. If you come from San Francisco, you're like, this is a city. So. Yeah, exactly. That was exactly <laughs> my story. Our, <laughs> but from our perspective, 
living in Oro Grande or Morro Bay or Paso Robles, San Luis feels like a city almost. Yeah. So. so you went to school in Denver. Yeah. And then you did, what did you major in? Actually in business. So oh, my okay. parents had their um, an antique store in Morro oh. Bay when um, I was right. younger. And I worked there. And so I decided I wanted to have my own business like them. Um, I think it's interesting being an entrepreneur um, and watching that in my family because my sister grew up in the same family as me and came away with the uh, belief that she did not want to do that. Mm-hmm. And she wanted went and worked for the city, you know, of Paso Robles. And so uh, mm-hmm. coming away, I think it's interesting coming away from, you know, looking at two people and and what they get out of something like that. So I always knew I wanted to own my own business. I didn't know what that looked like at the time. And uh, now I own a marketing firm here in San Luis Obispo that really has quite a few different divisions. And the thing that I'm most passionate about is helping small business. A big part of that stems Mm -hmm. from being uh, stuck in an antique store day in and day out and waiting for people to come And all I could think about when I got out was, how do you drive traffic to something like that? And so one thing I love about working with businesses is that I can go out and see people. I don't have to wait for people to come to me, which is pretty fun. Um, But not everybody has that luxury. So if you uh, do need to, you know, if you are kind of waiting for people to come to you, then marketing is a great tool to kind of drive traffic, whether it's a website, whether it's a retail, you know, brick and mortar, um, or, you know, something, some fair, something somewhere that you're Mm -hmm. out seeing people. So you do a lot under the umbrella of Simply Clear Marketing. That's right. So so tell me about that. So you have so, the home shows. Yeah, so, um, so we actually have three divisions. So we have a digital division and we build websites and do digital marketing for people. Um, along with that comes a consultation piece around marketing. So we, we will help um, people with social media and consult with them. And then we also, <clears throat> excuse me, have a publication that we produce that we're so excited and grateful to have your contributions to. And so fun. Yes. It's, <laughs> the magazine it's turned out yeah. great. So um, it's Living Lavishly and it has a website so you can view it, livinglavishlymag.com. And we also produce the Home and Garden Expos here locally. And so we do five events uh, locally that are, you know, pretty big size events for our community. So, so I don't know if anybody else, but I'm totally exhausted right now. Yeah. <laughs> and I always feel like that when I'm with you. I'm like, I think I do a lot of stuff. And then I talk to you and I'm like, oh, I'm such an underachiever. <laughs> Well, you know, it's a whole kind of morphed together over the years. It started out as one, and you know the rest. Well, you had just a newspaper. Kind of came, for yes, a long we did. Time we had too. newspapers yeah. for ten years, and so. So what was just, that like? Like kind of watching the the life of a newspaper kind of die, right? Yeah. Because of the internet. So yeah, it's been. I think it's been. Well, I mean, really, marketing has shifted um, in mm-hmm. a lot Very over the so. last fifteen years. So when we started, even our expos, you know, it really was like the only space you could find out what's going on locally besides the phone book. So right. now, obviously, yeah. there's internet and Facebook recommendations and, you know, all of that that's involved. And so we've seen a lot of shifting in marketing, and I think every business has. So I think the challenge for us is to stay up on it so that we can help educate all of our clients and all the people that are trying to focus on running their business and what they're good at. So then we can come alongside them and say, here's some recommendations for you and your company and your industry. So when a company comes to you, do you do, you do a pretty extensive research background we do. on them? Yeah, and, and then... <clears throat> it does help um, that I'm naturally curious about people <laughs> and their industry. So it's so interesting. Yesterday I was meeting with a company for the first time, and he said, nobody has ever asked me these type of questions and ah. these in-depth questions about my company, and, he, and they've been in business for 30 years. Wow. So, so what are those questions? <laughs> Well, I mean, it's, okay, let's it's, I'm I know, business. yes, <laughs> um, it's, you know, I think part of it is trying to understand the company and the industry to mm-hmm. be able to make the best recommendations. So, so kind of finding where their, their pain points are and, yeah, and, and how you can. Exactly. And kind of doing some, on some level, a needs analysis and, mm-hmm. you know, figuring out what what is going to work because uh, typically when somebody meets with a somebody in the marketing industry they're typically selling a product and so they want to 
pitch the product to you. And um, we've found over the years that the best way to suggest a product to somebody is to find out about the, as much as, as you can about their industry or their organization to find where it makes sense for the product to fit in with them. Okay, this is a great segue to talk about art. Exactly. Because we, I, this is what I kind of wanted to get into your brain about. Yes. <laughs> so um, as from an artist perspective, so my product would be a painting or um, let's just say it's a painting. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of different things that you could take that painting and apply it to different products. But for instance, if I wanted to have a show and I was going to sell my artwork, that's really hard for a lot of artists because right. a lot of artists have worked alone, you know, or with their cats mm-hmm. and yeah. <laughs> and the cat approves, right. but you, then you never know when you get out into the public if, if like people are actually going to like this yes. and um, it's, it's pretty nerve wracking. And then, you know, the whole imposter syndrome, like who am I to even think I could be selling this or yes. is anyone going to like it? So from a marketing perspective, what would be your advice that you would say to somebody who is maybe a little bit nervous about putting their product out there? Yeah. I mean, I think that the first thing that somebody is going to have to know from the bottom of their heart is that you love it. And if you love it, there's going to be somebody else out there mm-hmm. that does love it. Mm-hmm. Um, the reality is that not everybody is going to like everything. And just like you know, with my products and services, there are people that don't, aren't successful with a product or a service. And, um, and then I'll have the next client I talk to is very successful. So over the years, I've had to learn not to take all of that personally, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. and instead try to help the person find, you know, something that's a better fit for them Mm -hmm. and not take it so personally. So from an artist perspective, I do think the biggest challenge is that typically when someone is diving into art, you become so emotionally attached to the piece, whether it's a a painting or a fabric, because there's typically a story behind it. Mm -hmm. And so being able to detach from that and educate people on the process of it and let go of the results Mm -hmm. is a really important aspect in being able to get your name out there. Because if you don't put your name out there, then nobody else is going to love it. Right. If nobody knows about it, nobody's going to love it. (laughs) So, um, you know, kind of looking at where that fear is stemming from and Mm -hmm. working through it so that you can have the courage to put it out there. Mm -hmm. And I think that from a... Um, I think one of the biggest challenges, too, is that an artist doesn't want to sell themselves or um, talk too good about themselves Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um, has a perception, you know, that uh, that they're they shouldn't be doing that kind of thing. But the story and the personality is typically what causes somebody to buy something. Right. And so the more you can do that, the better off you're going to be with your art. Right. And that's what I, that I think early on in my career, somebody had said this to me that, you know, uh, people buy the person behind the brand. Absolutely. So if they like the person and they trust mm-hmm. the person, then they're going to be more <clears throat> apt to really want to invest in the product mm-hmm. that that person is selling. Yeah. Um, that's kind of why I wanted to do the podcast with all of these artists because I see so much beautiful work and I know them personally, but most people don't. So here's their story too, and here's their work. And it's kind of like you really get to know that person Mm -hmm. and it, I don't know, it's just so much more valuable and so much more interesting. And whenever I'm telling like an interior design client who were getting to the part of their home design and we're like, let's put up some art and they're like, oh, I'm just going to go down and to home goods, which I love home goods, don't yeah. get me wrong, but <laughs> when you have a, a town, almost every place where everybody lives has got artists in it that mm-hmm. um, can either work on by a commission or they will, um, you know, design something specifically, paint something just for your room. There's just so many p- different people that you can actually meet and know them, mm-hmm. go to their studio, go to open studios, get to know the artists, see their process, see how they create. And then you have original artwork in your home, which is so much more valuable than something that was made in China. Well, and I do think that, um, you know, there's a piece that comes along 
in that with education because it just goes back to value and what's where somebody places their value Mm -hmm. because if you are you know asking um, a little for a specific price for something and trying to figure out how to price your art then you are having to place a value on that and if somebody else doesn't have the same value then they're going they're not going to agree with that price point and you're going to see that across the board in any industry it's not just in art it could be clothing it could be mm. you know it mm-hmm. could be um a, an art a, like a home decor piece that's put out by a certain brand um all of that you can see it across the board and so kind of detaching from your own emotional attachment to the art piece when you're choosing price points and then going out and talking to people about what they should charge what you what they should buy it for Mm -hmm. there's a certain amount of value that has to be um, put into place for that I think that that is another one uh, another big struggle for a lot of artists is it's something, and I've struggled with it myself, it's something that comes so naturally to you. So you, it's hard to put a number on that of like, oh, well, this was really pretty easy for me to do, mm-hmm. this illustration <laughs> right. or whatever. But, but it's because I have years and years and years right. of experience and education and, and I've invested, you know, time, materials, everything into that craft mm-hmm. so that today it's pretty easy to do something Mm -hmm. like that not everything but so it is sometimes hard to put a number but there is actually formulas for pricing your artwork Mm -hmm. and um i think that that's that's a that's a conversation for another day but but um one thing that is kind of making me think about a conversation that i had with gina julian who's an artist that we had on the podcast and she talked about you know, would you but would you personally mm-hmm. spend four thousand dollars on a painting, mm-hmm. or you know, is that something in your um, your makeup that that you see the value in art that you would actually spend that much money on on a painting? And I think that's really interesting as an artist. If you were going to price your paintings at a certain price point, you should be willing to also spend that because that yeah. shows that you are valuing art well know? and it's funny you should say that because um i think that again it goes across industry it's not just artists yeah. um because uh, i was talking to a hairstylist and she has said the exact same thing because feeling comfortable charging a certain dollar amount right. that for you know doing someone's hair and being able to see the value in what she's doing and increase her rates mm-hmm. she had to go to another hairstylist a competitor salon and get her hair done and then felt comfortable raising her own rates and so i think that it's so really interesting we all I mean it kind of goes back to our own dysfunction and issues (laughs) about money about money yeah right and so being able to uh, do something outside of um out of your realm so that you can then feel confident in what you're asking for it makes a big difference and I think it goes back to even for us with uh, marketing services and it's it's actually even trickier having staff and employees that go out and sell your product and service because they're not investing in business. They're not making business decisions, Mm -hmm. um, you know, for their own company. And so a lot of times they have a harder time selling something at the price that the company needs it to Ah, be at. And so there's a lot of education that has to come, you know, in that piece as well. So we had touched base on a little something and uh, I kind of flipped the table on you and I was asking about like when you walk into a business and you're trying to uh, pitch your, this is why you should buy advertising Mm -hmm. in the magazine. Right. And the person says, no. Yeah. Right. (laughs) And then I was asking you what your response to that was. Well, I think um, there's lots of reasons why people say no. And I think the first thing is to get down into the depths. And so it does go back to asking questions. And my favorite question to ask somebody when somebody says no is, what's your hesitation? Mm -hmm. Um, And that question tends to... um, um, is is softer than why are you saying no? And it makes people think a little bit deeper about their motivation. Hmm. And so it tends to spark conversation and keep them, you know, talking. Another thing an artist could use because um, you're 
because you've created it is to just ask on it for honest feedback and mm-hmm. say, you know, um, mm-hmm. I'm the artist that created this. I'd love to hear your feedback about why it's not something you want to have in your home. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's just going to educate you about mm-hmm. the demographic and that person. And yeah. it doesn't, it's not yeah. something that needs to be if they say, oh, the colors don't work well. Because basically what it does, it opens up conversation for you to um, talk to them Um, about something else maybe you have. Mm -hmm. So for example, if they say, oh, I just don't really like that turquoise on that art piece, you can say, oh, well, you know what? I actually have this other one and it doesn't have any turquoise on it. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this? And so you're able to carry on. Or I can do a commission for you and do exactly the colors in your room. Exactly. And we can make it look work just perfectly for you. And I think it's interesting. I made a phone call yesterday and I had called another company. I was looking at something for one of our events that I wanted to bring in. And it was over kind of my budget. Budget. And I said to, you know, the gal, well, gosh, I think that's over my budget. I can't do that. And she said, okay, well, let me know if you change your mind. And I was so irritated from her with her from a sales perspective, because I'm like, why didn't you suggest one of your other products <laughs> that cost less? She just said, okay, and hung up. And I was like, she probably wasn't the owner of the company. No, it's true. And yeah. so I was, um, I thought, oh my gosh, she just totally blew it in this conversation because I'm open to wanting one of her products and she just closed the door with me because it was over my budget even though I know she has other uh, products that are a lower price point and so I didn't ask any of those questions because I kind of wanted the one that I wanted but you know if she had taken more time to ask me about what I wanted and what my vision was and why I was interested in that she may have been able to convince me to do something different you know again too like you're saying it's opening the conversation to create connection exactly. and then when someone feels connected with you and they start to listen to you and they start to trust you then they're well maybe i won't buy it this time but i might go back to that artist maybe later you know right. the next show and maybe i do want to support that person mm-hmm. so I'll, I'll wait until a piece comes up that i really like and then i'll buy it i've done that yeah. with other artists like they'll have things and like i really want to support this artist and i really want to have a piece of their art but it just not quite fit so i kind of watch and then when they come out with something that i really like i'm like oh there it is i'll exactly. get that one <laughs> yeah and i think that that's a really good um a really good way to look at it and i tell you know i teach classes about how to uh generate revenue at these events that we produce and one of the things I always tell our customers is that just because somebody isn't a qualified client for you in that moment it doesn't mean that they don't know somebody that is a qualified person or um, is going to be a qualified person in the future and so just to really take the time to create that connection and talk to them and you know um, get them interested in your product or service then at some point it's going to uh, pay off for you because they might be at a dinner party and say oh gosh it looks like you like this type of art and Mm -hmm. I just met someone last week and you know Mm -hmm. you just never know where something's going to come from and so just to look at everything as a potential opportunity Mm -hmm. and and to circle back around to that like don't take it so personally Mm -hmm. like just you've got to get to a point where you can detach it and and you were you and I were talking before and saying like that must be really hard because you're really putting in your like soul into a piece that you're creating and I was telling you that over the years doing a lot of commercial art um, you know, you get rejected all the time. Like, that's not the right color. It's not the right scale. It's like, you got to re- redo that, redo this, redo this. And it's a little bit easier because you're doing it digitally or, you know, in Photoshop or something. But you kind of get a thick skin after a certain point. You're mm-hmm. like, I get it. Like, it's just not right for you. But mm-hmm. that doesn't mean I'm a horrible person. Right. <laughs> or that my art isn't good or right. that, you know, it's it's just not the right fit for you. And sometimes it's not the right venue for you. I remember when um, I started out really when like in my early 20s and I was painting these boxes that were um all hand painted with Mm -hmm. like they were really gorgeous I even still have some of them and I went to a craft show I think it was in Morro Bay Mm -hmm. I didn't sell any of them like a lot of people like thought this was great and my husband looked at me because people are not going to spend money on something like that here this is a craft fair they've got like five dollars and they're going to go get a hot dog right (laughs) And, I'm, and I, that was like such a aha moment right. for me. Like there's, you've got to also know where to put your art. Mm-hmm. Like um, it has to be the right fit, you right. know? 
if you're going to physically put it in a store or put it in a gallery or something like that, it has to, you've got to figure out, like you said, do the research, yeah. use the client, you know, uh, and do all of that. Well, and I think too, um, I kind of started to say this, but I think there is a certain level of education on the value of it because mm-hmm. um, really for anybody to buy anything, they have to see the value mm-hmm. in it. And um, somebody may not um, really recognize or or just might not place the value that you place on that. And that's not a bad thing. You know, it's kind of like um, my family has this uh, family reunion that we go to every three years in Hawaii. And I think it's amazing. My mom thinks it's amazing. We have such a great time. Um, we stay at a little hotel and a lot of times there's a lot of Hawaiians, so they'll, we'll do potluck dinners and there's, you know, authentic Hawaiian food and it's really super fun. My aunt, on the other hand, you know, when she goes on vacation, she really wants to sit in some resort and have people bring her drinks and not. So, (laughs) so, um, so we are putting different values on that vacation time and what, you know, is important to us. It doesn't mean that one's wrong. It's just a completely different value. And so I think that happens in art a lot as well in purchasing products for your home that some people just aren't educated enough to see the value Mm -hmm. behind it or have the passion behind it. Mm -hmm. And so the other thing I think that's really important about that, then like, how would you say, like, how can I show that this piece of art is valuable for you? Well, I was just going to say too, I think a part of it is, um, education, um, because, and and also that people's values will change over time. So that's True. where I think that part of it is just staying in front of somebody that maybe they're not a good fit for you now, mm-hmm. but in three or four years, it could it could potentially change. Their whole taste might change. Mm-hmm. And so I think that that's a really important aspect. So like when I think about marketing and I think about an artist and the opportunity they have, for letting people know about them, you know, doing something like email marketing to just stay in front of mm-hmm. people for a continuous basis. The other thing is that the more you see something, the more you like it. So if you're able to stay in front of somebody for a longer period of time, it might be a few years before they actually choose to purchase from you because you've, you know, stayed in front of them. They've seen it continuously. They start to appreciate okay. it. I think this is a really great thing to talk about because that is actually a psychological thing. Like right. people are so consumed by media all the time right. that they have to see it at least a minimum of seven times yep. before it even registers exactly. in the brain what they're looking at. And I think for myself, as in my little Instagram world, like I'm always like, I gotta post something new, I gotta post something new. But I see a lot of artists reposting the Absolutely. same piece of art. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm constantly cranking out new art. I'm like, this is not, you know, sustainable. Mm-hmm. Right. But that that's um that's a good point because sometimes I feel like, gosh, I don't wanna like show this again. Like I've already showed this mm-hmm. and then, you know, you feel like I'm, do people even want to see that, you know, again and again and again, you know, so it feels a little counterintuitive Mm -hmm. to want to stay in front of somebody like that and keep putting it in front of them. But the psychology is actually the opposite. It is. And actually it's, um, yeah, most people stop after three times of connecting with someone in some way, whether it's, you know, a phone call or an email or something like that. But it typically takes people seven times before they'll make a decision. And so Ah. that's why a lot of times sales don't happen because people stop before people are ready to make the decision. Mm -hmm. And so you literally need to stay, you know, connected with somebody for a long period of time before they're ready to um, reach out. And then I think too, That's one of the amazing things with social media is that you can tell your story in little blips and Mm -hmm. continuously and over and over in front of people. And so being able to put, you know, how many hours you're spending doing art and, you know, those kinds of things, that's what creates value for people. They, and so that they're starting to understand the process behind it Yeah. because without the process, they don't know. And they say rude comments, like I said earlier, like, oh, my kid could do that. Yeah. And so <laughs> meanwhile, somebody has spent, you know, hours and hours um, contemplating a thought process, developing color aspects. And, mm-hmm. and so I think there's a lot of 
opportunity to educate people in the actual process of an art of an art project or an art design and um, and then taking that to the next level where then suddenly they're starting to see the value and then they suddenly want it in their home. I love that. I love that. I noticed that like when I'm working on something like a, a bigger piece and I'm, I'm usually showing that like on my story. So mm-hmm. it's like little snippets of like the process of that. I wouldn't necessarily do that like on my, my feed, but now it kind of makes me rethink that a little bit. Um, I think that that's really true. I think it's, it's, it is showing how much time right. goes into it. I was doing mm-hmm. like that huge painting I worked right. on. Like literally like my neck was out of whack. My, my, right. my hand was killing me. It was just hours of painting. And, um, it is, it's, you know, it's a ton of hours mm-hmm. that go into creating something like mm-hmm. that. And it's the pre-sketches beforehand right. and all the years of like putting it all together in your mind, kind of simmering it. You know, there's, there's something else I wanted to talk about when we were talking about, um, purchasing art. Uh, I had an interesting conversation yesterday with one of the Patreon members of the podcast. I was thanking her because we did the scholarships, hand of them out, and and she had actually purchased some of the art from uh, one of the artists that I had had on the episode. And she goes, I'm really happy to do it. It was really a pleasure. Um, Plus, I see it as an investment. And I wrote back, you're not kidding, because I knew that artist was going to be big, and now he's totally taken off. That's exciting. And you got a piece of yeah, artwork right. way back on the podcast when he was like episode, I'm talking about Ted Rice, like mm-hmm. he was just coming out, and I saw I saw him, when I first saw him, I was like, this guy's going to be big. Like, I, I loved his style, and I knew he was doing something really authentic and different, mm-hmm. and I talked to him years before I even had them, I had him on the podcast, and he was just starting out, and he's, and and now he's like huge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, he's like, I'm like, well, there you go. Right. Good. So listen, tell you people, the artwork, the people I'm having on the podcast, like <laughs> I know I have an eye <laughs> for who these artists are. And I can tell when they're going to be that's big so at some point. So yeah, that's it, is, it can also be a very good investment. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, especially when you can get, um, when you do have an eye or you can see mm-hmm. someone who's like, this is an emerging artist. Like this one's going to be big. I right. can see it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's kind of fun. And what we talked about a little bit is, you know, if you are looking from a, a marketing perspective on how to get your art out there and how to sell it, um, some of the things that I think are really important are to connect with people because they tend to buy from somebody they like. And so that's a really important piece. And to so tell do you your mean story. like connect in person, like have a show, be Oh, absolutely. And... That would be huge. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that would be amazing. If people can talk to the artist specifically and connect with mm-hmm. you, they're going to be way more um, um, inclined to purchase your Which art. Which is also, again, very counterintuitive for an artist. <laughs> I know, because a lot of times it tends to be introverted yeah, more than extroverted. So. Yeah. And so it can be really exhausting. But mm-hmm. the reality is people like to feel connected to yeah. people. And, um, and I think even with social media at the level that it is mm-hmm. nowadays, that there's a yearning for human connection. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, so actually getting out and talking to people face to face is, um, is really invigorating for a lot of people and you can act in a completely different way. I totally agree. Um, So I think that that's really valuable. I think it's really important to not take things personal and recognize that your artwork is amazing and that there's going to be people out there that don't like it. And there's going to be people out there that do like it and Mm -hmm. to just as humans, we tend to focus on the negative, and so to just focus on the positive ones mm-hmm. um, and just kind of let those other ones go. Mm-hmm. Um, and then to continue to stay in front of people. And so I think anything that you're doing, the more you can drive um, email addresses to yourself so that you can you know, stay in front of people in that, that form, I think there's a lot of value um, because... So the email um, list is really a big thing because um, it's the one thing you control. Exactly. As opposed to algorithms changing. And... Exactly. And I think, you know, about five years ago, everyone kind of thought email was going to decline and go away from that. But 
with mm-hmm. the way social media algorithms have shifted then you know now facebook and and instagram and you know whoever you're using owns all that information and you don't have control over it and they're controlling who sees what mm-hmm. so it's really important for you to grow your email base so that you can stay in front of people and it's okay if they don't open it every time you see it come through and your perception of that person is oh gosh they've got something new so even if they don't read your email mm-hmm. or open it they're seeing that you have something new and so it's some one month when you send that email they're going to go oh gosh i'm going to see i've got so and so's birthday's coming up. Maybe I'll get them an art piece or, mm-hmm. oh gosh, you know, my anniversary is coming up and I'd really like to do something special for myself and buy myself an art piece. So you don't know what's going on with people and that's going to trigger them to take a look and see what your most recent art pieces are. But the more you can gather that email address is the more control you have over it. Yeah, that's true. I, it's not easier said than done. <laughs> it sure is. Just like everything. Yeah. I mean, I think so because it's just, you know, there's, there's so many emails that come in in a day. Absolutely. And like, I know there's a couple that I, I love to always open or I say to open because they're, they're valuable. Sure. I see the value in, in the little conversation that they're, their information that they're sharing. But even like, I mean, I think about Bed Bath & Beyond, I get their emails and they send way too many emails. I just delete them like nine times out of 10. But then there's that time when I'm like, oh, I I need to go down there. (laughs) Oh gosh, I think there might be a coupon in there. And so I search my email for it. So it keeps it top of mind for me as an option for shopping. So you don't see it as bugging people? Absolutely not. It's staying in front of them. It's not bugging them. Oh, so how often would you send out an email? Oh, I think easily at least once a month. Once a month? Uh-huh. Okay. Mm-hmm. Twice a month is okay? I think that's absolutely fine. Okay. I think twice a month is fine too. Especially, you know, um, when you're doing, I guess when it comes to email marketing, what you want to do is, is um, display some value so that when they do open it up, they're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Or, oh, I'm seeing something new. Or they're feeling some connection to you. Mm-hmm. So by just making sure that you have that information, something fun in there that is connecting them. And, you know, maybe it's a, a process and maybe it's, oh, here's my um, pencil drawings for this month. Open my email next month to see my um, watercolor design or something like that. Ooh, that I kind love of, that idea. Yeah. <laughs> Um, kind of keeps people interested in um, in staying connected to you. I think there's a lot of opportunity. What other ones you got? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to do that. <laughs> um, I mean, like I said, I think it's just anything that, that shows value. And even educating people on... Um, on art as an yeah, investment. I had one that I I get uh, from an artist that I interviewed, and she hers today was like how to hang art in your home and how to select. She exactly. does things like how to select art for your mm-hmm. home, and, you know, knowing about the scale and the size and mm-hmm. where to get frames and mm-hmm. and things like yeah. that is always really helpful because I think people do like they they'll purchase something and they're like I am, don't even know where to go get a frame. Well, and for <laughs> content, a great way to get content is to go do like an art fair or a show and sit there and talk to people, write down right. every single question they ask you, and then all of a sudden you probably got content for an entire year. Because that, that means people do not know the <laughs> answers. And it's stuff that the most challenging thing, I think, and it goes back to what we started the whole conversation with was like your own personal value is that you don't realize how much you know because it's all inside your head and it's your experience. And yeah. so I remember when I was writing the book and I was telling that to you, I'm like, who's yeah. going to want to read this? And you're like, right. I, I will. I, exactly. <laughs> yes. And I, that was really helpful for uh-huh. me because I was like, you know what? I mean, this is stuff that I know because I've done design for so many years, but it's like, maybe some people won't know this. And exactly. So, yeah, it no, was... There's a ton of good, great information in your book. So I think it's Thank just you. putting together that content would really, um, um, and, and in a simple, easy way like that makes it a lot easier for you to answer questions and put together content. It doesn't have to be this huge, overwhelming task of what am I going to send out in my email every month? You can be like, oh, look, here's six questions people have asked me. Um, last time I was out, you know, talking to people about art and I'm just going to answer these once per month and somebody on your list is going to find it interesting. Such Great advice. I love that so much. I'm actually totally going to do that. Good. Yay. I'm so excited. <laughs> I had to find an event to show my heart. <laughs> anyway, that's that's really helpful. Yeah. I really, really like that. So, um, okay. Well, I usually, uh, I'm usually going to kind of 
Uh, see, I told you, like, this could literally go on. I know. <laughs> we'll we probably do, should wrap we'll it up. We'll do another series yeah. <laughs> of um, specifically relating to this. But um, I wanted to ask you, when you were starting out, I always liked it, because this is geared towards, we just had our scholarship recipients, yes. so heading off to college. Like, what would be your business advice uh, to your younger self just graduating from college? Oh, that's a good question. We're not necessarily mm. graduating, but choosing to go out. I mean, you chose yeah. the, the entrepreneur path. Yes. As opposed to your sister. So yeah. what what would be your advice? Um, hmm. That's a good one. Especially for an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Well, I've had lots of successes as an entrepreneur, and I've had lots of failures. <laughs> so I'm trying to think. Is there something I could have learned to have not made the failures? And it's so interesting because sometimes I think the failures are the things that taught me the most about marketing and business. And they enable me to relate to people in ways that um, that I didn't realize. And so like I think back to um, a show that we produced that had no attendees. I mean, there were some people that came, but literally it felt like no attendees. And I literally couldn't talk about it for six months because <laughs> I was so... I bet. I felt like such a failure because of it. Um, but now, you know, gosh, it was like eight years ago. So now I can look back and see all the things that I've learned from it. So I guess my, based on that, my advice would be to recognize every failure as a learning opportunity Mm -hmm. and to take that and um and dig deep enough into why it was a failure what happened to make it Mm -hmm. that and learn from it and it probably it wasn't you it was no and and, 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 you know it's funny because going back to what (laughs) i said earlier from an art perspective of listening to the negative feedback there are still people that were at that show that told me successful stories about that show. And so I still feel like it was a failure, but there were still people that had mm-hmm. success out of it. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, it's not really even fair for me to say that, knowing what I know now, mm. that really I should stop calling it a failure, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because it was such a learning experience for me. And, um, and also it was a humbling experience. And I think at that time I really needed to be humbled. And so, mm. um, so I think that, you know, any anything that comes your way that you view as a failure to, to, to take the time to analyze and look at that and learn from it. Well, and that's what they say. Like, that's when you really expand is when you go through the difficult times. That's mm-hmm. when you really learn. Yep. Why does it have to be like I that? I know. <laughs> if only everything could just be easy and graceful. <laughs> I know, but right? that's not the case. I so. think we, we want to have those experiences. So we know what we don't want. So we know what we do want. Exactly. So. No, it's true. Well, Lonnie, this was so amazing. I just, I, you know, I just, I love talking to you and like our, our brains kind of get together and we start spinning and it's so much fun fun. and I really enjoy it. So I will definitely want to have you back on again if you'll, if you'll come back on. Of course. Thank you so much. (laughs) I always love it too. You're inspirational for me. So I appreciate that. (laughs) Same. Thanks, Lonnie. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you like this podcast and you'd like to support it even more, you can join me over on patreon.com slash Mari Robeson and become a patron of mine. If you're a patron of mine, you'll receive bonus episodes every month only for patrons. You'll also receive 20% off all the merchandise in my online shop, mariropeson.bigcartel, and you will be receiving free printables every month that will be of my artwork and they're some really fun things. You can follow along on Instagram and you can see what I'm creating just for my patrons. I would deeply appreciate it. It would help me keep the lights on and it would help me pay all the fees that it takes to put together a podcast like this so that I can keep supporting all the artists, keep bringing you great information, keep paying it forward to the next generation of artists. It's just a wonderful thing and I would really deeply appreciate your support.